Good morning, uh, and thank you, Peter. It was interesting to hear just the, obviously, a big, strong relationship with IWE in the past. Um, it's interesting to think that the last time we probably spoke about offshore, apart from the recent conference in ARCA, was probably around 2004. And here's a fact you might have forgotten. In 2004, Ireland had the largest offshore wind farm in the world. The largest offshore wind farm in the world. And look we are, where we are now. Okay, and a lot has elapsed since then. Obviously, we've made huge progress from an onshore point of view. But what I'm going to talk today about is very much around the challenge. And when you see the challenge, and then you turn that into an opportunity, you see the urgency around offshore wind. And I've no doubt the panel will talk through all of the opportunities as well as challenges for offshore wind going forward. I should also say it's great to see so many people here this morning. Um, I see things have changed in IWE. I think there was a 2 a.m. finish last night, as distinct from the customary 4.30, so uh, well done for being up so early. Um, let's get started then, okay? Just by way of SSE, I'm not gonna go through too much on SSE, other than the fact that you know, we're a big player in offshore wind. We've over seven gigawatts of offshore wind in different stages. We've got the Greater Gabbard that's operational. We've got Beatrice Wind Farm that's actually under construction at the moment, will be competed later this year. And we've a number of big wind farms competing later this year in, in, in the upcoming auctions in the UK. So we're a major player. On top of that, in Ireland, from an onshore point of view, we've over 740 megawatts of operational wind farms and around 600 megawatts of third party PPAs. So again, a very big player in Ireland, having invested over 2.5 billion since we started in 2008. Okay, so let's start with the challenge. Uh, I think even Donald Trump, on a weak moment in a personal reflection, will actually turn around to himself and say, actually, climate change is serious. Um, because there's no doubt, you only have to look at the evidence that's there, whether it's you know, the hottest day on record in Australia, whether it's the beast from the east last year, whether it was two weeks ago having beautiful sunshine and a day later, it's minus three degrees. You know, there's huge impacts right across the piece around climate change. And, and, and the reality is, you know, we, we've seen huge economic prosperity over the last 100 years. But we've done that on the back of fossil fuels. We've done that empowering our economy, empowering social, you know, so, social movement forward on the back of fossil fuels. And that now is actually starting to have a significant impact. And you know, not only do you see it in reality, you can actually see it on the, on the trend here across the curve about climate change, and particularly around temperature. And as you can see, since 1960, and particularly since 1980, we've seen a huge increase, a significant increase in the ramping up rate of global temperatures. And when you look at actually the most recent report from the IPCC, they talk about you know, the potential now to actually see a 2% increase in global temperatures. And whilst it's a, you know, it's a 600, 700 page report, when you actually cut to the chase and actually get down to it, the biggest impact there is on our species. We're looking at 20 to 30 percent species to say, uh, you know, removal over the next, by 2050. But most importantly, on a, on a, on a, on a personal level, on a, on a fatality level, we're talking about climate change contributing to over 250,000 deaths per year, an additional 250,000 deaths per year. So, you know, Barack Obama kind of phrased, you know, we are without doubt the first generation to really start to understand the impact of climate change. This is the biggest challenge of our generation, but we're also probably the last generation that can do anything about it. So, you know, we, if we pull it back down from a global level and we talk about from an Irish perspective, and we've heard our tea shop nine months ago talk about being laggards, we've talked about, we've heard about actually, you know, different committees coming out. The reality is, on, a, on, a, on an overall level, our carbon emissions is not something we should be proud of. And there is lots of reasons for that, there's no doubt about that, and very justifiable reasons. But we set a target for 2020 to have reduced our targets by 20%. The likelihood is we will exceed our targets. There will be no redu reduction. If there is a reduction, it'll be in and around 1% to 2%. But the likelihood is, we, best cases, we will remain flat and will possibly exceed. I think where the good news is, and I touched on this earlier, is around renewable energy and, and the electrification, and electricity um, generation. When you look at the, the second graph I have there, that's around carbon abatement. And since 2001 to 2017, renewables in, in particular, we've seen 4.2 million tons abated from our system. That is significant progress. Renewable energy now produces almost 36% of our total electricity used in the island of Ireland. The target is to get to 40%. That is a huge achievement. And everyone in the industry, onshore, the ESB, air grid, government policy, everyone across the industry should be incredibly proud of that. 
But the challenge is, how do we actually turn that on the, on the left, your right-hand side, into making a significant difference on the right-hand side? Because we are still going to, as I said, if we are lucky, we will remain flat. So when you look forward and you think about decarbonisation, yes, electricity can play a part. Right now, electricity, if you look at a non-ETS, is probably around 25%. But however, the opportunity is there now to actually go beyond those power generation. To go beyond, if you look at, you know, Euroelectric came out with pathways to a, an 85% reduction in carbon intensity by 2050. You can see the complete change in the fuel mix. You can see the huge opportunity that electric vehicles, that heat, there's over 610,000 oil boilers here in Ireland. The challenge is how we're going to change that. You know, if you think from a transport point of view, the, the national target is to get to over 500,000 electric vehicles by 2030. Again, how are we going to progress that? What is the policy? What is the instruments required to progress that to achieve that target? Talking about non-combustion uh, engines by 2040, this is a big, big challenge. But it is a huge opportunity for the electricity sector. And, and as I said, to date we've done incredibly well. Going forward, it's now about a step change. It is about this year we've had probably our best year ever from an onshore renewables point of view. We've delivered, I think, about 400, 450 megawatts. On average, it's closer to two to 300. As you go forward, we're talking about a step change of almost eight to 1,000 a you know, gigawatt every year from renewable energy. That's the direction of travel. The challenge for Ireland now is can we really take advantage of this opportunity? And to me, and we're going to, obviously, there's a big focus on, on, on offshore today, because I've, I, you know, at SSE, we very much believe that offshore is the technology of scale that can deliver this step change. Yes, onshore will play an important part. Yes, solar will play an important part. Other technologies emerging will play an important part. But when it comes to the large scale, we are talking about offshore. And why are we talking about offshore? Look at our seabeds, 10 times the size of our land mass. Look at our wind resource. Yes, we have a number of projects on the East Coast currently. If you look to the West Coast, initial measurements on the West Coast is talking about capacity factors of 60 plus percent. That's, you know, 60 percent. That's on a par with actually conventional fuel plants. You know, that is a huge opportunity. It comes with other challenges. Getting out to obtain, operate and maintain them will be a challenge. But, you know, our location as the most southwesterly country in Europe, we obviously have the best wind resource in Europe. It's a huge opportunity. And what was interesting as well is when you look at uh, the work that's been done by the Irish Maritime Development Office around our ports, we obviously have significant port infrastructure right around the country that can actually support and service this industry. Yes, there is upgrades and investment to be made, but the basic infrastructure is there. And I think when you, when you combine our location from a, from a wind resource and the size of our seabeds with our port infrastructure, then you look at the other big factor that's changed from an offshore point of view. When I started in the wind industry back in 2003, our biggest wind farm was 12 megawatts. We were about to start a much bigger one than the goal, but our biggest wind farm at the time was 12 megawatts. Offshore wind turbines are now nearly 12 megawatts. One turbine, same size as the equivalent of an offshore, of an onshore wind farm in the past. Yes, we're getting to scales now for onshore over 100 megawatts, but you can actually see the trajectory all the way back in 2004 when we built Arco, um, which at the time was the largest offshore wind turbines. Uh, it was an innovation project with GE to really go and demonstrate this, this, this uh, technology, 3.3 megawatts at the time. Turbines are now being installed at seven, eight megawatts this year. In the next number of years, the upcoming auctions you're gonna see in the UK, you will see 10 plus megawatt machines. I have absolutely no doubt about that. And with scale, the price of deployment has cons consistently reduced. So back in auctions, back in when, when we were actually building Gabbard back in 2008, I think the auction was around 140. At the time, it wasn't an auction, 140 pounds per megawatt hour. The last auction, the equivalent was around 70 pounds per megawatt hour. Obviously, there's an upcoming auction later this summer, and we're all looking forward to seeing what type of prices they, they outturn in that regard. But the, the technology is developing at such a pace Combined with the high extra capacity factors, that's what's making offshore the differentiator going forward that can take on the opportunity. So if we keep going from, a, from an Irish point of view, and you know, th th this slide has been seen before, you know, we've done a lot of work with KPMG uh, in the past and, uh, and, 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 and other companies, and you, and you can see, again, I think it sets it out incredibly well 
you know, offshore wind resource, it's huge. I don't need to talk about it again. It's absolutely huge. The potential is enormous. Availability of capital, last year it was over seven billion pounds spent on offshore. The last 10 years, over 70 billion. If you look at an overall target from, from a European point of view, Europe is actually going to get to a median case around 70 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. The opportunity for investment here is huge. Um, developer utility capability, as I've talked about SSE and our, and, and our involvement in Ireland, obviously we're progressing to Arco Bank's um, offshore wind firm, but ESB are now in, in the business, Parkwind are in the business, Stackcraft are in the business. You know, a number of large, big players are in the business in Ireland looking at opportunities to progress offshore wind. Cost of deployment is falling, we've talked about technology. With increase in technology, we also look at the benefits coming from the supply chain. A lot of the supply chain has moved from the oil and gas industry now into offshore. The challenge is actually availability, but the price is continuing to fall. Skills based from an Irish point of view, I took a delegation last year over to, over to, over to our offshore wind farm in Beaches, North Scotland, and I'm happy to talk, we'll talk a little bit more about it later. But actually, when you look at the skills base from the IDA, from Enterprise Ireland, right across the piece, there's a huge skills base here that's also complemented from the UK, uh, and that is here. And government policy, you know, we should recognize the fact that RES has opened the door for offshore wind. There's no doubt about that. Is, that is the first step, but it is the first of many steps. We now need to build the right policy, the right direction, set the ambition to come in. And, 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 and the reality is, you don't have to look too far to see how this is working. You only have to look at the sector deal that was announced in the UK in the last couple of weeks for investments up to 2030. 30 gigawatts in the UK by 2030. You know, huge 300,000 jobs, 30 billion in investment, you know, six, up 40 to 60 percent of total investment in offshore wind staying in, in the UK. These are huge numbers. And this is an opportunity, again, that Ireland should be taking. So when you look at the benefits, again, the economic opportunity, the reality here is, despite our best efforts, we will come short on our targets this year, and we will end up paying fines in 2020. The best wind resource country in Europe will be paying fines for not meeting the targets, despite its best efforts. Again, there's a significant benefit here for pushing forward onshore, offshore, all renewable energy sources. FDI benefits, I don't think it's any surprise when you look at the big investors coming in from the States, coming in from all over the world, you know, obviously energy supply is critical. Clean energy supply is becoming even more critical. This is a big value add. It's a big differentiator from an Irish perspective. Grid efficiency, currently we have over four or five projects at different stages on the East Coast. East Coast being where the main demand center is. Tapping in on the East Coast is, is, is well, it's not straightforward. It is less challenging than some of the big grid infrastructure projects we'll need across the country. Electrification of transport, it will come, target 500,000. Social and community benefits, I think, is something that should, should be touched on. We're all very familiar with the community benefits that we've all contributed to right across as, as an industry. At SSE, we've contributed over six million in the last 10 years to local communities. This, again, is about coastal regeneration. It is about investing in communities. We're not just in in the short term, we're here in the long term, and really seeing that positive impact you know, this industry can have at a local level. And then lastly is around the EU tar targets. And, and, and currently we're talking about a 55% target to 2020 or 2030. The reality is we should have ambition to 70%. Like David Connolly and I, we have been, have been pushing right across the piece. We should be pushing for 75, 70%. That should be our minimum going forward. So it's easy for me to stand on the stage today and talk about all these great benefits. Uh, I, want, I want to show a quick video, it's 90 seconds, just around you know, an offshore wind farm that we're building in, in, in Scotland. As I say, we had the privilege to go over there earlier this year with a delegation of key stakeholders from, from Irish government, IDA, Enterprise Ireland. Really just to you know, really get an appreciation of the scale of the investment, the scale of the opportunity, but more importantly, to see how achievable it is. This is within our reach. We now need to move forward and actually deliver it. So I just want to take you through this very quickly. So Beecher is our, is our wind farm that we're building in partnership with Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners in the north of Scotland. It's 13 kilometers off the Scottish coast. When it's built to be 84 turbines, uh, 588 megawatts. Uh, it's a significant investment, 2.6 billion in total of which 40 to 50% 40 to of that investment will actually go into the UK. 
At this stage, we've got around about, I think it's, we're up at 69 turbines completed uh, with a view to being fully operational by the end of the summer. And it's an incredible project. It's an incredible infrastructure to see. At the end of the day, you know, this is about powering homes, about changing how we f our fuel mix. 450,000 homes will be powered from this power station. So when Beatrice is built, and it's an absolute privilege to be involved in that project, but when it is built, it would be the largest infrastructure investment project in Scotland in the last decade, number of decades. It's a huge project. It's making a huge impact on the ground, particularly in the local area, North Scotland, in, in, in a town called Wick, where there will be 90 jobs, as, as, as the video talked about. But you can really see the coastal regeneration at play straight in front of you. This is a major investment by SSE and its partners in the north of Scotland, but it's not the only investment. Like in the UK at the moment, I talked about before, seven gigawatts currently built in offshore wind. Recently announced financial codes for the largest, which was Norstead Wind Farm, of 1.2 gigawatts in Hornsey. And the overall ambition in the UK is to get to 30 gigawatts by 2030. And you translate that then into an investment of between 40 and 60% of that total investment staying in the UK, that's trillions of pounds. That is a huge amount of money going forward. So, I get this. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to conclude now. I, I think I'm, I'm approaching the end of time. So, the, the, real, the reality here is we, we've got this massive challenge. We've got this massive challenge, not only for our own generation, for future generations. But we're in an in, incredibly privileged place to be actually able to do something about it and to know about it. And from an offshore point of view and an onshore point of view, there's big opportunity going forward from an Irish point of view. In the short term on the east coast of Ireland, you know, we have four to five gigawatts of projects at different stages. Some of those projects ready to go, some of those projects in the process of getting ready to go. But ultimately, we can deliver four gigawatts of offshore wind by 2025. That's an achievable target. If you go beyond the east coast, you look at the west coast and the huge potential that is there, that actually when we get to a point where we're meeting national targets, and although I'm reluctant to say it, there's a massive opportunity then for export capacity once we've met our national targets and actually delivered huge economic benefit from an Irish point of view. But in, in the short term, it does require certainty. It does require ambition. We need a grid connection policy that actually works for offshore wind. It's, it's, it's encouraging to see some, or hear some of the conversations with the CRU at the moment around its own independent connection group for, for offshore wind. It also needs a clear signal the idea of actually saying our target is 1.5 gigawatts of offshore wind, I'm sorry, but that's nonsense. There's an absolute huge opportunity here. We should be coming out really boldly, like we've done in the UK, and really attack this to really drive the investment that we can achieve. You think about it, 30 gigawatts in the UK by 2030. Not only is that ambitious, it set a clear path for investors, for, for stakeholders, for supply chain to build large capabilities in the UK, and Ireland should be replicating that. And I suppose I, I'm, I'm just going to finish on um, the picture here is the Pacific Orca. I, I won't lie to you, it's, the, it's, it's by far the biggest ship I've ever seen. Uh, it's one of the installation crafts up, in, up on Beatrice. And when I look at the scale of the size, I think of two things. Firstly, I think of the challenge. This is a new step forward. This is a complete step change for how we install and build big, big large scale infrastructure projects. But it's also an indication of the massive opportunity that actually lies in offshore wind. The world is moving to a low carbon future. Renewable energy is going to play the biggest part of that. Wind energy is going to play a huge part of that. Offshore wind is going to play a huge part of it. And the challenge, you know, when I think, you know, I'm a father of three kids and I do think of their future. And I do think of what the world will look like in 20 years when they're 25, 30, you know, in those ages. I think about how we, 
make decisions now that will have a huge impact on their future going forward. And now is the time to take that challenge. And whilst it is encouraging to see progress being made, we need a lot more progress. And we need to really grasp this opportunity. Thank you for your time. Thank you.